Shane, let's start with you. Um, uh, the key area of the strategy here for places is divided into beaches, ocean and rocks. Let's talk a little bit about the recommendations there. Um, one of the things that piques my interest is this is a little bit more than drowning. You're actually encouraging us to look more closely at other injuries in the coastal environment. Yeah, 100% correct, uh, correct, yeah. What we've been looking at is um, it's not just the drowning, it's other type of fatalities and also injury, which can be short-term and long-term. Uh, but we know with the, the work that we've been doing recently that, you know, twice we've been focusing on drowning for a long time and working with uh, yourself and people like Amy and Alison, et cetera, what we're finding is that it's far more reaching and, and as um, in particular as uh, first responders. Um, we don't know whether we're attending a drowning incident or, you know, whether it's some other a medical episode, an accident, whatever it may be, we're attending to someone in distress in some uh, or, you know, in uh, drastic need of attention. So from that perspective, uh, we need to understand that to see whether or not we have the same causal factors, which are, uh, which are attributed to drowning, or whether there's other contributory elements there. So we're looking at what that may mean to us for uh, a member welfare aspect. Um, as part of it so how do we take care of our members and make sure they're either equipped to deal with the situation um, or have the right equipment to actually respond to those situations and also manage it afterwards so you know whether that's ranging from uh, uh, motorboat accidents to um, uh, self-harm whatever it may be we're finding that you know we uh, you know for example last year we know that we had 125 uh, coastal drowning deaths but on top of that we had another 110 other type of coastal fatalities and that's from uh, marine stingers to, to sharks, through to self-harm, to the accidents, et cetera. So there's a great diversity and that um, exposure impacts far more broadly than just the drowning, um, which is still a priority of, um, and the number one priority for us. But then we're also looking at those other longer term injuries uh, with um, spinal incidents and other um, injuries which have far reaching impacts through to, you know, friends, family, loved ones, the community. So. Uh, from our perspective, it's, you know, what are all the issues that we're facing? How do we reduce that? Because they, um, you know, whilst drowning is vitally important, um, there's some other um, domino uh, effects that go on with some of these instances as well. Right. And I think we should acknowledge um, that it was First Responders Day yesterday. Um, and so your organisation and many others, Marine uh, Rescue, um, uh, combined to provide a really great service across um, the coastline. Can you talk a little bit about the elements of the strategy that, that talk about uh, technology and innovation in terms of those frontline services um, and, and, and those first responders? Yeah, most definitely. Um, I guess probably one of the key things that we've been looking at, and it's, uh, it's a bit of chicken and egg, is you know, what data can we collect and how do we collect that? So part of our technology is looking at smarter systems to make it more efficient for collecting the data. So for the number of rescues that are occurring, where they're occurring, the type of incident uh, that it relates to, the who the people are, uh, what's the demographic and age and um, nationality of, of these people um, at these locations. So looking at smarter tools to make it easier for our members to record that data, which will help inform us and others um, so that we may be able to look at other prevention strategies around that for the future. Um, technology wise also we're looking at um, how do we respond so there's been a lot of work done uh, in particular out of uh, Victoria and Queensland and more recently in New South Wales with um, alert systems so emergency beacons um, and camera systems so that we can uh, monitor more locations in remote areas but also busy areas where we may not have always have the eyes there so we can monitor them and uh, looking at systems where if something does start to occur that we can respond to them in an efficient and timely manner. And then that's gone through to where we've um, been working with drones um, and looking at them for uh, prevention type activities, for search and rescue type activities, and just for general surveillance. So it gives that extra set of eyes, a three dimensional picture, so to speak, from the air where it will um, paint a bit of a picture uh, for surf life saving the lifeguards so they can have a, a greater awareness of what's happening around them and hopefully prevent incidents from occurring in the first place and that goes right through to you know with uh, looking at new, you know, new technology around our rescue devices whether it's helicopters jet boats inflatable rescue boats to other com uh, communications and smart tools for reducing risk so we've been doing a lot of work around um, uh, surf risk rating apps to try and firstly internally 
so how we can use that to actually identify a risk and therefore um, have some clear understandings of what we can do to mitigate that but we want to turn that into a bit more of a public facing tool as well so a member of the public can see uh, can go there and do a very simple risk assessment using this tool and that'll inform them that you know maybe they should be swimming at a patrolled beach or other considerations that they should be making um, so that they can make an informed decision about um, recreating at those locations. Great, thanks, thanks Shane. Amy, you've been doing a little bit more coastal research lately um, than you previously did. So tell, tell us a little bit about that research, but from the perspective of how it might inform um, approaches to prevention. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, my heart is still with rivers, but it's been nice to to collaborate a bit more with Surf Life Saving in this role and um, conduct some research uh, alongside Surf Life Saving. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's been really interesting to look at some emerging issues. Um, the points that Shane made about the data collection challenge are really interesting. Um, and I think it's uh, quite uh you know, to think about rivers as well, if, if, if surf life saving and, and, and those coastal environments are having challenges with data collection, then that's going to magnify those issues for our inland environments where we don't have a, uh, you know, a designated uh, team looking at safety and, and looking at how we can collect that data from the community, I think is going to be really uh, important in the river space as well. But it's been really great to collaborate on that research and look at where we can share lessons, I guess, both from a data perspective and some of the work Royal Life Saving has done to build a, an amazing database, um, but also, I guess, think about the lessons we can share between environments and learn from each other. Thank you. Um, I'm just watching the chat and there's not a lot of activity. There are 84 people now on the webinar, which is pretty fantastic. Um, but the Royal Life Saving Team are busy on teams and they're exchanging shortbread recipes. I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, but I have been reminded that I didn't acknowledge the traditional owners on which this webinar is taking place. So I should acknowledge the Camaraygal people, which are the traditional owners of the land on which I live here. So I acknowledge their elders past, present uh, and emerging. Um, but what I'd like to do um, is now is actually just show uh, one of the SLSA uh, campaigns in this area. And while that's happening, we're going to bring another speaker in and we'll surprise you with that person. So let's go to the video. So you think you know about rib currents? Myth. Only tourists get caught in rips. Myth. Experienced swimmers can always spot a rip. Myth. Rips only take the lives of poor swimmers. Fact. It's young men who are most likely to die in rips. Risk the rip. Visit beatsafe.org.au to find out what you don't know about rips. Fantastic. And of course, it would be an incomplete discussion about rips without having Dr. Rick, Rick, Rip himself. Uh, so I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Rob Brander to the conversation. Thanks, Justin. You, uh, you have the best virtual backdrop in the entire sort of world of drowning prevention and life saving, I must say. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique insight into my uh, man cave, actually, which is also my garage, which is about seven degrees Celsius at the moment. So, oh. so let's let's talk about that man cave, but in the context of, uh, of men and the problem of men and rips and rip communication. Um, and so what's, uh, uh, you know, this myth campaign, which I think was a very strong campaign launched a few years ago, um, uh, delivered, uh, I guess, a couple of very strong messages to men. Yeah, I mean, that campaign, um, the young men was one aspect of it. There was a number of very good videos. But of course, young men, you know, they drown in rips just like they drown in other coastal environments and other inland waterways because they're the risk takers. But I guess the, the question is, um, when they see something like that, does it make an impact? And I think um, in terms of rip current education or any sort of drowning education, when we put these materials out there on social media or whatever, they're fantastic. Um, but we really need to know what are people taking away from those videos and what are they remembering and is it actually impacting their behaviour? Yeah, and Shane, you, you, you were, I imagine you were very much behind the design of the campaign. How, how did that campaign work from your perspective and what were the key messages? Yeah, it was critical to us. When we uh, commenced this campaign, it originally came about with we we're looking at what's our new campaign and where we were going and we... And we had a, a bit of a look at it, you know, and it was focused on swimming between the flags, um, which has been, a, you know, an adage which we still promote today. But 
it was something that we were putting in and it was a bit probably warm and fuzzy at the time as we had done with a couple of campaigns whilst they um, met our brief they probably didn't address the issues that you know Rob has uh, referred to as well so with this one of the key things that we did is we had a look at some of the data we did a fair bit of research we worked with uh, uh, Omnipol, uh, Ipsos, looking at different things. And the research came back showing us that, you know, a large proportion of uh, the public, you know, over 86% said that they know that they're meant to swim at the beach between the flags, but they don't do it because it doesn't apply to them because they know how to spot rip currents and that it's tourists that get in trouble. And so we had a bit of a, a change in our direction and said, right, you know, for the rip current campaign, we came up with a five-year strategy and it was having a couple of years, and this was with the experts telling us, about behavioural change, and it was a couple of years of actually myth busting, breaking down the truth, and challenging people, not giving them the answers directly, but giving them a bit of a challenge to make them think and make them own some of their um, decision making and finding out that information for themselves, providing them links and directions to that. Um, and then for the last three years, then about challenging behaviour. So the, the RIP Current campaign, it's in its fifth year now. So yeah, the first two years was about myth busting and that's what you just showed then. And then we had the last three years about a change in behaviour. So the key focus for us was to challenge people to get them to own it. And I think it's like anything, if you told someone it's wet paint, most people want to go up there and test that for themselves. And so we, what we found is, and Rob was involved in something we did probably, gosh, Rob, uh, eight to 10 years, 12 years ago, where we had a RIP current symposium or forum with people and we had so many people coming in telling us that rips only ever recirculate and what we what we knew, do know is there's 17,000 uh, rips on any given day in Australia that they're unpredictable um, and, and Rob led a lot of that research and so what we wanted to get to people is that you know what people believe to be the truth may not be the truth um, and myth busting was the first step to that um, because what we noticed is that um, you know, a large proportion of the population said that they could actually identify a rip currents. But what we found is two out of three that said they could identify a rip current correctly actually got it wrong. So, you know, only one third was actually getting it right. So we've created a bit of a, a monster for ourselves that we've been putting out a lot of information about rip currents and being Australian that we all know, you know, we all go to the beach, therefore we know what we're doing. Whereas mm -hmm. the fact is that rip currents are very hard to identify. And so there's, that was a challenging perspective for us. So the rip current, was very focused on the behavioural change, but people owning that decision. So experience can't, you know, an experience can't always be given, but we needed to take people rather than telling them, challenge them so that they would look into it further and identify that information and therefore hopefully own that moving forward. Mm, thanks, thanks, Shane. Um, Rob, uh, like I, I do think even over summer, we have this tremendous debate largely played out in the media and with multiple voices, Julie Power did an article on this, I think, just in, in uh, February. And this, the question is, um, float, parallel, um, we just seem to continue as hard as you and Shane work out. We just seem to send multiple messages still out to the community. Where, where is that going to land? And who, who are we talking to and what messages do we need to deliver? Well, that's a good question because, as Shane mentioned, um, rips are so unpredictable. There's different types of rips. They behave differently. Some recirculate. Some go out. And we've done we've done actual experiments of putting people in rips and testing these escape strategies. And there's not one single escape strategy that will always work. Um, so it's it's difficult to give a single message about what to do when you get stuck in a rip. Um, I can't promote floating over swimming out of a rip because they don't always work. Um, sometimes they do. So it's a problem. I mean. You know, with, with rip currents, there's awareness. People need to be aware that they exist. They need to have some sort of basic understanding of what they are. It would be nice if we could train people to do little spot rips, but of course, different types of rips exist that look different. There's all sorts of different visual signatures. And it's easy to show pictures of, of pretty obvious rips to, to people and say, this is what a rip looks like. But when you put them on the beach, that doesn't always translate because the surf zone looks often chaotic to most people. And Shane mentioned that stat that many people who think they know they can spot a rip actually can't when they are shown photographs. But the situation is actually worse than that because there's been some research come out of New Zealand and we've just done some at unpatrolled beaches in New South Wales where we actually have people on the beach. Where we show them three or four pictures of rips and say, can you spot the rip? And some of them get them, get them all right. And then we say, well, look, there's, a, there's rips on this beach. Can you actually spot them? And they can't. So 
rip education is is tricky, but I think there has to be first some basic awareness that if you are swimming outside of the flags or on a unpatrolled beach, on a surf beach, there's a strong likelihood that there are these rip currents that are actually pretty serious and, and cause a lot of drownings. Um, because you want to, people to avoid making bad decisions about where they're going to swim. Having said that, you know, invariably people will still get in trouble in rip currents. So we have to tell them something. And that's where it becomes complicated. So the other factor that's very hard to get a handle on is even experienced swimmers, when they get caught in a rip current, they, they invariably get, get panicky and they start to get exhausted. And a lot of that good advice that they may have remembered sometimes goes out the window. Mm. Um, Amy, you did some research, uh, probably with Richard Franklin and, and perhaps with, uh, with Jazz Laws and Shane, um, just about this notion of rescuers getting into trouble. Um, Barob's just, uh, someone on the chat's just mentioned that issue of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's the chat and questions that are really about uh, strategies well outside of the flags, but there's also this notion of rescuers themselves getting into trouble. Can you comment on, on this issue that you've been researching? Yeah, it's so tragic. I mean, you know, we try and convey common sense and talk about risk to rescuers and that if you're untrained, the risk is quite high that something could go wrong. Um, but at the same time, it's human instinct to want to help someone. And the research that we've done has shown that it's often a child or a family member, a loved one, a friend that you'll be going to the aid of. And so I can completely understand why you know, common sense would go out the window and you just try and, uh, and help people. So I think it's about, you know, ideally everybody has those rescue skills and has done a, a bronze medallion and, and knows what to do, um, has learned CPR as well. Uh, but I guess if that's not going to be realistic, it's talking about how to, you know, stop and have a think, uh, call for help. If there's a talk or a reach rescue, a way that you can, you know, enact a rescue without getting in um, or taking flotation devices with you. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if we're talking about the coastal environment, really primarily encouraging people to swim between the flags so that there is someone there to help you should something go wrong. Um, and I guess at our rivers and when we get onto our inland environments, it's really about people having those skills to help should something go wrong. Uh, but yeah, it is a really challenging one because as we know, it's a child, a loved one and, and common sense really will go out the window in these high stress situations. So if we can be putting people in safer positions with the skills to help, um, maybe we can see those kind of uh, statistics come down. Yeah, I might, I might just add something to that because um, the bystander issue is becoming increasingly more of an issue. And we've done a lot of work with, with Shane and Jazz at Surf Life Saving. One, establishing the scope of the problem, but two, actually um, talking to people who've been involved in bystander rescues. And, and what's really coming out of all of the research is people aren't using flotation devices. Um, and as Amy says, you know, people are going to rush in. If it's, your, if, it's, if it's your child or somebody you know, you're probably not going to think too much about it and just go in. But what we're trying to find is really what, what are the simple mes messages that we can get out there that will resonate with people? And it might be something as simple as don't rush in, you know, take 10 seconds to get somebody to get help, look for a flotation device. But this also relates back to, um, Shane didn't mention it, but, but part of the, the surf uh, rip current campaign was this think line approach where you go to the beach and you stop, look, plan. So you stop and you, you, you look at the situation, you think about if there's any hazards, where you might get into trouble. And if somebody does get into trouble, you have a plan. And that might just be, where's the nearest boogie board that I can grab to go in. And I think that think line approach is simple. And I think that's something that we should really, really keep pushing. And, and so on that, Justin, use, yeah, yeah, sorry, on that, Justin, and 100% and correct there, Rob, um, on that think line campaign, you know, all the people that are in the, and I don't know whether everyone's seen the, the think line advertisement. I know you showed it uh, in your um, session last week, but the think line has all those people have been in um, caught in a rip at some stage have had family members in there. So um, the last person that we have on there is Derek Wilson, who uh, lost two of his own children and two of his nieces who went to rescue those children in a, a very um, sad and tragic event down at Gunnamatta. So four, you know, four, four young, young lives lost in uh, one tragic incident as a result of a rip current. And, you know, when we got these people engaged, that's what it was about. It's, you know, and we're talking to them. And there was a question here, uh, which, uh, which Richard said about, uh, 
you know, did we engage young males, et cetera, who are part of this demographic? We engaged a lot of young people to see what would be the mechanism to get there. And it was about not telling them what to do, but giving them prompts about how to be staying safe. And that's where we came up with, okay, stop, stop, look, plan. So we're not saying you can't go in the water, but what we're asking you to do is stop and consider what are you, ha you know, what are the risks where you're going? Do you know if it's dangerous? Do you not know whether it's dangerous? Um, you know, uh, look around. Is there, you know, is there a patrol beach nearby? Can you see some other potential hazards? Um, you know, can you look for the rip current and plan? And you know, one of the things we've done there is we've developed uh, the website beachsafe.org.au, which is also available on on an app, uh, which um, shows the approximately twelve thousand beaches around Australia, and just gives you some hazard rating, some safety information, and locations to uh, other areas where it may be safe to swim. So. Um, a critical factor for us is about um, providing that awareness and that information so people can be better informed for when they are going to be uh, heading to these coastal locations. Because as Rob mentioned, you know, um, one of the th key things that we did with the Stop Look Plan is there's no red and yellow in it. It's not about surf lifesaving. It's about the community. And, um, you know, we've got 314 surf lifesaving clubs around Australia. There's 12, you know, nearly 12,000 beaches. We patrol around about 500 beaches. But we, you know, we're a vast coastline, 52,000 kilometres of coastline, including all our islands. Um, so we can't be everywhere all the time. So we need to be looking at how we empower people to actually own some of the water safety behaviour themselves. Yeah, I've, I've been watching uh, eagerly on social media, Rob. Um, and some days, particularly on a Sunday, I wish I was a coastal scientist because it seems like your students have more fun than even Andy, uh, than uh, Professor Short's students used to have when they mapped all of those beaches that Shane was referring to. Um, is it ethical to put a PhD student in a rip? Or is it all in the name of science? Is it ethical? Um, I'm, jo I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> you, should ask, you should ask Will Kuhn that question because I threw him in a rip at Duramba um, about two weeks ago. All he's in the name a, of science. A, he is a trained yeah. lifeguard. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are you finding when you're going to the? Uh, Shane's mentioned the many non-patrol locations, and and Australians love getting away from it. There's not actually quietly. There's nothing better than being on a beach um, with very few people and enjoying the surf or time with friends. So, what are you finding when you're going to these sort of high-risk locations without patrolling services? Well, this this is the elephant in the room. I mean, for so long we've we've propped ourselves up and we've reinforced the swim between the red and yellow flags message, and as we should. But the reality is, is that there's so many beaches that are unpatrolled um, that probably won't be patrolled. And they're very, they're very popular tourist destinations. You've got coastal tourist parks situated on those beaches. And it's unrealistic to think that those people who've paid that money to stay at that beach are going to jump in a car and drive 25 kilometers to the nearest flag beach. It's just not going to happen. So in that situation, we have to give them something. And that's where this think line approach and, and, and Shane's approach to, to just putting the behavior on, on the onus of the people is key. And we have to somehow ingrain messages into people's psyche that, look, if you're not on a patrol beach, you, you, you've got to have a backup plan. You've got, to, you've got to think pretty hard about whether it's safe to swim or not. Um, and that's, that, that is going to be the ongoing challenge because people are not always going to swim between the flags for a whole bunch of reasons. And, and our research is finding that we surveyed almost well, over 400 people at unpatrolled beaches in the last summer season. You know, we, we were asking, why are, you, why are you swimming here? And a whole bunch of reasons. One, it's close to their accommodation. Um, it's their favorite beach. Um, they want to get away from people. They like the quiet of it. And invariably, if you're going to go to a beach, probably you're going to go for a swim. Um, with that, Robert, I'd like to thank you for joining the webinar. I, I think it's been a really great surprise contribution for everyone. Um, and we're going to move on and just talk very quickly about rocks and then get to Amy's favourite topic, rivers. Um, so thanks, Rob. Have a great day. Um, yeah. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. All right. So we've got a short video. We're going to talk about rocks in a moment because I think that um, Rob was sort of overlapping with these other locations. So uh, there's a video that uh, we're going to play just quickly. We know that they'd been on rocks at Bush Rangers Bay. They were hit by a big wave and washed into the surf. The life-saving Victoria helicopter, the police air wing, the air ambulance all responded to this situation. They were able to rescue five people, but one person has drowned. This is a beach which is not patrolled by surf lifesavers. It's renowned for big surf and strong rips. This is, in fact, the second 
helicopter rescue at this location in less than a week. Unfortunately, on this occasion, one person could not be saved. Five others are now in hospital. So obviously we can't talk about the circumstances of this particular, it's more just an example. And Shane, I know we had over summer um, a number of examples, very visible examples, tragic examples where people were swept from rocks. Um, they didn't intend to be in the water. Um, they were there for other reasons. So what, what do we need to do in this area? Yeah, thanks, Justin. Yes, uh, for summer, it was a very tragic uh, time for many. You know, we had uh, our second highest number of drowning deaths over the summer period in the coastal environment in the last 10 years. So, you know, that's quite dramatic. And rock fishing was very prevalent in that with a couple of multiple tragedy uh, tragedy incidents which occurred, um, not just in New South Wales, but we had them in Victoria, WA. So they're happening around the country. Uh, but yeah, some of the big ones happened here in New South Wales with the, the multiple tragedies. What do we need to be doing? Very simply, we need to be working with uh, the various communities, with the councils, the government, uh, to put in place uh, practices which are going to ensure the safety and well-being of just not those people participating in the activity, but those that may be called upon to go and assist them. Um, and we know that that happens far, far too often um, in that sense where we've had police, we've had surf lifesavers, off-duty um, police and lifeguards, etc., all responding to different situations and members of the community and putting their lives at risk. Um, so, with the life jackets, we know that uh, you know through the great work that's been done previously with Randwick Council doing the trial on the life jackets, we know that it's been effective in in many respects. Other councils, it's you know it's voluntary for them to sign up to it. So, you know the life jackets is one part of it. I know um, that there's been also some work done around. You know, talking to rock fishers, and we've got, and we've done a lot of research. We've worked with the University of Melbourne and uh, Peak Hampshire, etc., where we've been talking about um, those behaviours. And what we're finding is that it's generally the inexperienced people, people unfamiliar with those areas, which have been getting into trouble. But it's also um, breaking down that barrier and the stereotype that wearing a life jacket means that I'm not right. tough and all this sort of Am stuff. So it's just challenging those behaviours. We're going to get to rock fishing a little bit later when we so this is one of the challenges in designing a strategy right so um, it's this overlap between activities and uh, places and so there's a whole session on rock fishing yep. so hold your thoughts there uh, Shane um, I guess I mean I do think it overlaps quite significantly but outside of rock fishing we've got yep. this issue of people uh, and I think the headlines over the summer were the selfie they were going to a particular okay, mermaid pools, those sorts of places where it's Instagrammable. Um, Amy, what do, what do we need to do to get the messages out to those sort of, you know, that cohort of people? Yeah, it's, um, it's an increasing issue, I guess, a, a modern phenomenon that we're facing. Um, and we did see that research come out globally, I think, that found that drowning was the leading cause of death due to uh, in selfie related incidents. So I guess people are, certain people are taking risks to get the shot for, for uh, Facebook and for social media. Um, we have these kind of picturesque but pretty isolated and risky locations being popularised on social media with hashtags and things like that. Um, I think we've got to think about how we can get warnings out to people who uh, might be intending to go to this location for one reason and as you said before Justin never even intending to get in the water um, so it's about those warnings I know you know figure eight pools uh, is a location that I believe national parks closed at times to try and keep people out um, we've got the option of signage but you know signage is not particularly effective necessarily people may not really read it or, or take notice of it so I think it really is quite a a modern challenge and and as we've said every word every time it really is back to people making better decisions so if we can talk about the risk and really make people think about whether it's worth uh, a great shot and a couple of likes on instagram whether that's worth risking your life 